First and foremost, I need to make this very clear. The local law enforcement has been very well notified about this situation, and my family has a member of a federal agency that is aware of the situation as well. I know that people like to dive into stories posted sometimes, but please know that the situation is being taken care of as we speak. I also have no issues submitting proof of this story, but only once things have been taken care of legally. But for the utmost safety of my family and from the guidance of my lawyer, law enforcement, and family, I will only be posting information I choose to share for the time being. Please understand that. Now what's been going on? Less than half a year ago, my wife and I purchased what we considered our dream home. It's exactly what we've been discussing about what we wanted in our home to raise our family since we started to get very serious as a couple. To paint a picture for you, it is a completely redone farmhouse that sits on a large amount of land. We have a very long driveway that takes you right up to the side of the house. The house cannot be seen from the road we live on, simply just because of how far back and where the house sits. Our neighbors are a pretty good distance away from us. They are both an older couple, and they have been very vocal about how happy they are that we are there. They have been great, and could not have been more welcoming to me and my family during the initial move-in process. My farmland is mostly behind my house, with only a little bit of it starting on the right side of the house, and then a few acres on the left side. On the left past my property is kind of dead land, where no one owns it or takes care of it. After my property ends, there is a huge amount of brush and grass built up, and there's a ton of large trees that scatter right up to my neighbor's property. These trees are just a small patch of woods, but it is probably around an acre long. Behind my house is a very large barn. The barn isn't far from the house at all. If I were to guess, it's probably 50 feet behind it. Even though the house is gorgeous after the major remodel and the previous owners did sell the house, the barn is in its original glory. It's old and sort of falling apart. I have made it very clear to my daughter not to go in certain parts of the barn simply because I don't trust the old wood to hold it up. This barn is not locked ever. I just don't have many belongings in it and also I quickly realize there's a few places to get into the barn other than the front entrance. And there are very obvious spots just due to the wood breaking down and getting older and older. I'm sure that it was a nice barn in its glory days, but to me and especially my wife, it's a massive eyesore. It's very large, but for the most part empty. I keep my riding lawnmower in there and I have some miscellaneous tools in there as well. The barn is never used by us. Four days ago, my daughter came running into the house terrified. She's under 13 years old. Again, I'm choosing to vague in some parts of the story just for protection. And I immediately thought that she was playing outside and walked up on a snake. But the fear in her eyes was just different. She ran full force into my body and grabbed onto it with her life. She was hysterical. After a minute of trying to calm her down enough to get a word out of her, she told me that she found bones in the barn. I still didn't think anything of this because I just assumed that it was a coyote or a dog or some other animal that took shelter in the barn during some time and then died there and no one found it. I quickly asked her to show me. She guided me into the barn and pointed up to the second floor. I call it the second floor because it's not really that. It's just an overhang that is near the top of the barn that has a ladder going up to it. Not entirely sure what this used to be used for, but it's not used by us at all. I also know that there's zero chance that a dog or fox or any other four-legged animal stumbled into that part of the barn for shelter, since I've never seen a dog climb a high ladder. My protective dad mode immediately turns on and I knew something was up. A few months ago, I decided to climb up there just out of curiosity and found a board that came up. The previous owners used to hide money throughout the house and property, and I actually found a wad of cash hidden in this very board. But after that day, I never went back up there. Once I climbed up, I saw that my daughter found that board and lifted it up. But she did not find money. 
There was a trash bag with multiple bones inside of it tucked inside the hidden spot. This is hands down the scariest moment in my life. Because I know for a fact that this had been placed there recently. Because when I was up there, it wasn't there. I immediately made phone calls and the local police and crew came out. The entire property was overran with different types of vans and cars. My family was questioned very intensely for about two hours, asking us every single question you could possibly ask someone. One of the officers pulled me aside and told me that they are in fact what I feared. Human remains. After the longest day of my life, some information came out from the last owners that there was a problem with squatters in the woods on the very edge of my property. I had never seen anyone roaming around or any sign of anyone going through my things. Looking back now, I made a very dangerous and idiotic mistake. I installed a camera system when we first moved in, but made the decision to only put cameras facing the front of the house and driveway. I figured there was no rush to get to the cameras in the back. Easily one of the biggest mistakes of my life, since we would have been able to have footage of the person going into my barn with this bag. When going through the camera footage with the officers, we discovered something extremely chilling that I somehow never saw, because up to this point there was no reason to check the cameras. Caught on the camera exactly five days back, at the early hours in the morning, the side motion light of my house turned on and you could see multiple shadows on the ground of people walking by. But that absolutely is not the part that made me shiver and make this grown man almost fall to the ground in tears of fright. When going back to the footage, every night after the five day point leading up to this point, every single night, two men wearing some sort of identical masks and completely covered in clothes head to toe would walk up my driveway and just stare at my house. The shortest time they stood there was a tiny bit over 20 minutes. The longest time they stood there was right under two hours. Standing there, completely still, just looking at my house. My hands are shaking so bad just typing those sentences. The local police put us up in a motel around 30 minutes outside of town promising us that they would make routine drive-bys every 30 minutes to check on us. Why they would not have officers posted outside the room at all times, I have no idea. And I am extremely upset with that decision. We were in that motel for two nights. The first night I got zero minutes of sleep. I held my family extremely tight and watched the door for every single second that night. The police did hold up their promise of checking on us. On the second night, around the similar time of the two men we would catch on camera, we awoke to an extremely loud banging on the front door of the motel. I jumped up and went into panic mode. We waited in silence, and nothing happened. I got on the phone and dialed my direct contact line to the police. Within only a few moments an officer was at the motel. We were taken to a new location and have been here for a few days. My family member in the federal agency has intervened and is personally taking care of us. This is an ongoing investigation and I cannot give more details than what I have given already in this post. My family is safe and I am safe. I again beg for the privacy of this situation outside of what has been given in this post. I will 100% sure update on this account once everything has been taken care of. And I will make sure to update you to tell you that we are safe once we are for good. My family is in extreme fear of the unknown. We have no idea why any of this is happening to us. And even though it all just started, we are so ready for this to be behind us. I spend all of my time just staring. Staring out into the distance waiting for those unknown men to come take my life, my daughter, my wife, and my unborn baby. Wherever they may be, I'm here, waiting and ready for what's next. A couple edits that they added after the fact. As I was expecting, some people are finding this story to be fake and my account to be fake. Perfectly normal reaction that I expected. 
Like mentioned though, I will happily give proof once I am given the okay. A lot of detail has been removed from this story. Please keep in mind that this just happened to my family and I. There are still answers that we simply don't have and I will not for an unknown amount of time. In order to not risk any sorts of leads, clues, or anything, I just told the very stripped down version of what has happened to us. I have been told that things don't add up, and that makes perfect sense considering there are portions left out. Because right now, at this moment, they simply just have to be. I hope you can understand that. This is definitely going to be hard to believe, and I know, but I feel this is good for me. It's time to tell this story. I just apologize for this being so short. Currently it's 1.05 in the morning, and honestly I don't think I can write this any time but now. So, here we go. Back in 2017, my cousin Austin killed his ex-girlfriend and then himself. I hung out with him the night he did it. According to the police, at about 7.30 a.m. he got into an argument with his girlfriend's mother over the girlfriend leaving him. He got angry and pulled out a pistol and shot her in the abdomen. When the girlfriend came rushing into the room, he shot her too. Right in the chest. Then he went into another room and shot her sister. Allegedly, he left them to bleed out. He just walked out of the house and drove away. Going straight to mine. Although he didn't show up to mine until about 4.30 that day. But I swear he acted normal. Nothing unusual, at least to me. All couples fight, so when this happened I figured he was just in a bad situation. He told me he was having some relationship issues and needed to stay somewhere. So I ordered pizza and we watched a Netflix documentary. A few hours later though he said he was going to crash. So I gave him the guest room and went to bed soon after. But by the time I woke up, news of the family's murder actually broke. Austin's picture was on my TV screen and he was long gone. Immediately I called the police and informed them that the boyfriend of the victim stayed at my house. And before I knew it, a state trooper was outside my door. Without hesitation, I let him in and we discussed everything. Whether it was the color of his shirt or if he had sweat on his brow, we covered it. But that's when he got the transmission over his radio. Suspect's been found. They found him on a dirt road about three miles from the murder house, dead in his car. He shot himself in the head. He still had the gun with him. He could have killed me. I could have been one of his victims. It's been years, but I still get nightmares. No one in the family really talks about it anymore. We've put it all behind. But the fact that I was around him after he did such a heinous thing is just unbelievable. I slept in the same house as a killer and didn't even know it. And that's what scares me the most. Back when I was 17 through 19, I worked at a small local bakery. There were less than 15 employees spread across the night and day shifts, so we only had a few people working during the day. One of these people was Dave the delivery driver. Dave immediately gave me an off vibe. He was in his mid-fifties and way too friendly to a teenage girl. But the boss told me straight up that yes, he could be annoying, but no one worked harder than he did, so just ignore his antics. When I signed the paperwork, they never asked me to submit to a background check. In hindsight, that should have been red flag number two. Over the course of the year or so that I worked with Dave, I tried very, very hard to ignore him. He was rarely outright creepy, but he was always just a bit too friendly. He would stick around long after his shift was over and talk to me and the other pastry chef on shift. He always wanted to lick the bowl after I made Rice Krispie treats. He would always stand in front of the racks of equipment or ingredients, 
just enough that sometimes my hand would brush him while reaching for something. He always stood just a little too close. He was constantly asking me about my life, what I liked, what I did for fun, if I had a boyfriend. Almost daily he would tell me how a nice girl like me should have a boyfriend, how maybe a boyfriend would be good for me. I let this slide because sometimes older people can say things that were meant differently in their time. Then it was the concert invites. Every other week he had tickets to one concert or another. Once he figured out my genre of music it was almost exclusively tickets to bands I desperately wanted to see. But I also knew that I should not go anywhere with him. I don't like to associate with co-workers outside of work anyway and I had seen way too many red flags about Dave to trust him for even a second. My birthday came. He brought me a t-shirt. It was two sizes too small. He told me to try it on, and I said no. He told me to try it on after work and text him a photo. He gave me his number, and he asked for mine. I said no. He asked the other pastry chef for my number. She had my back and refused him as well. He also brought me two tickets to a band I'd been wanting to see. VIP section, 21 plus only. He said he could get me in, but I would have to go with him and him alone. I refused. He told me he could get me booze. I declined. For months and months, this continued. I brought it up to one of my bosses, but they laughed it off as classic Dave. When he wanted a hug on his birthday and hugged me without my consent, there's Dave for you. Offering to get me booze or pot? Ah, Dave, you scamp. When he pulled up his shirt and showed me his abdominal scar from a snowboarding accident. Well, that's just Dave. No respect for boundaries, but a good worker. I seriously considered having one of my big, strong male friends come in under the guise of being my boyfriend just to placate Dave. I was repulsed by him, but he hadn't really done anything to classify himself as a predator. Besides asking for my number, he had never tried to harass me outside of work hours, and besides the odd hug or two that I was too afraid or shy to refuse, he hadn't gotten super physical. Then one day, Dave was gone. His name disappeared from the employee roster. My boss asked for me to see her in her office. She informed me that Dave was no longer employed at their business. Dave had been fired. Dave was fired because Dave was a convicted sex offender. Davey here had two counts of rape and one count of kidnapping a minor from the mid-90s. About the time I was born, actually. They had never background checked him. And when they contacted a friend in the police department, they found out that Dave had been lying on a lot of paperwork hiding the fact that he was a convicted felon and not notifying anyone when he moved. Once they brought this information to the police department's attention, they had a few more charges to add. They found out because apparently he had been stalking and harassing one of the clients he delivered to, showing up at her home when he should not even have known where she lived. After his termination, Dave showed up to work one day. He had a weapon, but I never found out what he had. They told him to leave or the police would be called. He ended up leaving in handcuffs. I am so thankful I wasn't there that day. Another little tidbit. The police officers my bosses knew had been in the PD for a while and knew one of the officers who arrested Dave in the 90s. That abdominal scar was from a run-in with the cops when he got injured trying to climb over a fence. That was a few years ago but sometimes I still think about how badly things could have gotten if I had gone to one of those concerts with him. Just a quick description. I am a man. I just also like to feel attractive and wear beautiful but identifiably masculine items of jewelry to make me feel more attractive. They are also very Jewish items which is important to me. Also, the crocheting is just so I don't have to spend a lot of money on new blankets I've outgrown. I don't know how to crochet very well, but I'm trying. This just happened a few days ago. 
I'm Jewish and I wear two items of jewelry that I am very attached to. One is a thumb ring inscribed with a prayer in Hebrew, and the other is a disc inscribed with a Hebrew blessing and a gold star of David in the center. I was out for part of the day to get a checkup at the optometrist and to buy some new knitting supplies. I was heading home and right outside my apartment building an older aboriginal man, I have nothing against aboriginals by the way, came up to me and asked me for a dollar. I don't carry cash and I told him that. He looked quite aggressive and probably very high. So when he told me to sit on the bench, I did. In hindsight, I should have walked away. But he was definitely high on something that made him very aggressive, and I'm a somewhat shy person. I was planning on ignoring him in favor of a cigarette and my book, and then quietly slip away. That did not happen as he immediately started insisting I take him inside to show him my apartment. There is no way I was doing that and repeatedly declined, getting increasingly annoyed the more often he insisted, slurring the entire time. He asked me for my name. I lied and gave him a fake name. Any time I made a movement to leave, he would put his arm in front of my chest. I hated being touched, but I was too shocked, confused, and annoyed to tell him off. Within just a few minutes, I was very annoyed and feeling harassed. I stood up too fast for him to react and then he spotted my necklace. It is a beautiful piece and makes me feel very manly and safe when I wear it. He got very excited and asked me how much I'd sell it for. It is not for sale and I told him so. He threatened to slit my throat if I didn't sell it. I ran away. I decided against going in through the front door as you don't need to use your coded card to get inside during the day. I opted to go around to the back of the building and use the back door, which requires the card at all hours and the doors shut faster. I spoke to one of the guys at the reception about a half hour later and he wrote down some notes to give to security. If they see him again they will ask him to leave and call the police if he does not. It's definitely not the first time I've been harassed, but it is the first time I've been harassed by someone definitely high. Also the first time someone has tried to force me to invite them inside of my own home. I'm a 28 year old male and this event happened a few years ago. I worked at a bakery and we had notoriously early working hours. So early I couldn't even get a bus or any sort of transport. It was midwinter, dark and around 4.30 a.m. I was walking to work, a route I took daily, only 10 minutes from my home when I see two men walking behind me. They were a few paces off and I had been mugged before, so I knew to try and lose them without outright running. I crossed the road. They did too. I took a different road. They did too, and quickened their pace. They stopped me and I knew I was fucked, but stood my ground and hid my phone in my pocket. When I had been mugged previously, they stole my phone and kicked my head in, and broke my nose and my eye sockets for good measure. So I didn't really want a repeat. One of the guys stopped me and asked me if I knew what time it was. I did and I told him. He didn't seem quite impressed though, and asked if I could call him and his friend a taxi. I was a little confused, but said I didn't have a number for the taxi. He seemed to get more annoyed and pulled out his own phone to tell me the number. First thing that went through my head was, why is he asking me for the time when he has a phone? And, why does he need me to call when his phone is right there? I started to back off, trying to get away, saying that I was going to be late for work. When the other guy who had somehow managed to get behind me grabbed me in a headlock and started punching me in the face. My mind is a little fuzzy on what was said during the attack, but I remember hearing my nose crack again over him ordering me to hand over my phone. He called me a motherfucker among other things, which I can't quite remember. I somehow ended up on the ground with him kicking the back of my head while his friend grabbed my phone out of my pocket. That would be the end of the saga, 
However, as they ran away, one of them turned around, flashed a knife at me from the waistband of his sweatpants, and told me when they saw me again, they'd make sure I wasn't so lucky. To this day, I have no idea why I wasn't stabbed. My PTSD was already through the roof from my previous mugging only a year and a half before. So after this, I'm genuinely terrified to meet those two guys again. Back when I was a kid, my mom and I had a deal. She'd schedule all my scarier appointments, like dentist visits and vaccines, in the morning. And if I went without whining or fussing too much, I'd get to play hooky for the rest of the day from school and we'd get lunch, go to the mall, and see a movie. This was one of those days. It was a few weeks before Christmas, but the mall was pretty quiet because it was around one on a weekday. I'd had my picture taken with Santa, we'd done some Christmas shopping and had lunch at my favorite restaurant, and we were finishing off our day with whatever kid's Christmas movie was playing at the time. I don't remember which one it was, but I remember how fun and pleasant the day had been. The theater itself was almost empty. Just my mom and I and a few parents with kids too young to be in school. A few minutes later, a single man walked in. I remember him entering because I thought it was weird he didn't have any kids with him. And because he seemed to spend a long time surveying the theater. The way people do when they're trying to find a seat or two in a crowded auditorium. I remember him staring at me for quite a while, but then he sat down near the door and I didn't think too much of it. A girl I played with in my neighborhood had really strict parents and they always went to see kids movies alone first to be sure they approved them. Maybe his kids went to school with me and he recognized me and that's why his eyes had lingered. Just as the previews started I realized I needed to pee. I had just turned 8 a few months earlier and my mom was finally letting me do things without her accompanying me. As I got up to go, my mom slipped me a $10 bill and told me to get us some candy and soda. A real treat in my house. I was so excited to be trusted to go by myself and to get candy that I almost didn't notice when the man from earlier got up and followed closely behind me as I left the theater. Almost. As I was allowed to do things by myself more, my parents had drilled into me that I always needed to be aware of my surroundings and anything that felt off. And the way he bolted from his seat to follow me out of the theater felt off. To give context, the movie theater was attached to the mall, so the main entrance was through the mall itself. To make getting out a little easier, there were a few exit-only doors that led to the parking lot. The restrooms were right next to these. The man followed me all the way to the woman's bathroom, not close enough to immediately spook me if I hadn't noticed him, but close enough that any passerby would just assume he was a father trailing behind his daughter. After I got to the restroom, I peeked out. He had stationed himself just outside the entrance to the bathroom on the side closest to the exit. I'd told myself that maybe he needed to use the bathroom too, but clearly he didn't. So I peed and then I waited. And waited. I heard a man's voice just outside joke with someone about how he was waiting for his daughter who was dwaddling. I knew my mom wouldn't get too worried and come look for me immediately because she would assume I was online to get snacks. But I couldn't get back to her without going past the man. Finally a nice looking older woman came in. As she was leaving I told her I'd forgotten how to get back to my theater where my mom was waiting and asked her if she could walk me there. I held her hand tightly as she cheerfully told me that she would be glad to help. As we left, the man waiting took a step forward, like he'd been waiting to grab me. When he saw I was with the woman, he turned around and left out the exit door. I made it back to my mom without incident. I told her that I didn't see any candy that I wanted and I was kinda full from lunch anyway. In hindsight, I should have just told her right away about the creepy guy who had followed me. But I was too afraid I'd lose my precious new independence. But looking back as an adult, I still can't find any benign intentions that would explain his actions. And I desperately hope that he didn't catch some other small girl unaware.
If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to subscribe, leave a like, and share it with your friends. And if you would like to help support the channel, make sure you go check out my Patreon page. You can get a link to all of my exclusive content, as well as content that's uh, unlisted on the channel, all that good stuff. And I also want to give a big shout out to the author of the first story. I really appreciate you allowing me to narrate this, and I hope everything works out for you and your family. I can't imagine the fear. Especially having the person come and watch you after. Not gonna lie, I did get chills reading that part, which is very rare that I actually get chills reading stories. Please make sure to keep us updated. As you already said you would, but I'm gonna check back with you here in a bit too. But thank you again. And a big thank you to everyone else who also allowed me to narrate their experiences. I will catch you all in the next video. And just remember, it's always scarier if it's true. Bad bye. When I was 13, I used to go catch crab on the beach with my father. Just kidding, I don't have a father. But I used to go catch crabs on the beach. At the time, we didn't have much money, and crab was a great way to feed the family and try to get a few bucks from the locals. So I'm down by the beach one time, looking in the tide pools and everything, and uh, I see a sea anemone. So I put my finger in it. For those of you that don't know, a sea anemone is pretty much something that attaches to a rock or something like that and has tentacles that come out and it's really squishy. So you can put your finger inside and it'll close around it and it's really squishy. So I got done fingering the sea anemone and decided to go continue my endeavor looking for crabs. Out of nowhere, a guy swims up out of the ocean. At first I thought it was a surfer who I might not have seen, but he didn't have a board and he wasn't even wearing a wetsuit. This struck me as extremely odd because it was a cloudy and rainy day. The waves were pretty nice, so if it was a surfer that would make sense, but once again he didn't have a board. He was in his boxers walking up to me. Before he got too close I screamed out to him and asked if there was anything I could help him with. He didn't respond. He just continued walking towards me. I immediately sensed the danger and was about to sprint off, but then I realized he was an adult and could probably catch me. So rather than that, I figured I'd jump into the ocean and swim as far away from him as I could. So I jumped into the ocean and started swimming as fast as I could away from the land. The guy stops on the shoreline and just watches me. I pause when I'm about a hundred meters out. I'm starting to get a little bit worried that I might not be able to make it back to shore, so... I lay on my back to conserve my energy and the buoyancy of the salt water pretty much keeps me afloat without having to do anything. I figure I'll do this for about 10 minutes and regain all of my energy and then make my way back in if he's not there. After what I thought to be 10 minutes, I started swimming normally and quickly realized I was now double the length away from shore. So I start the long, tedious task of swimming back to shore. Fortunately, I'm a great swimmer because at an early age, my father taught me how to swim. Just kidding, I don't have a dad. But I did teach myself how to swim. Well, I more or less jumped into the water and just, uh, bobbed there for a little while. But now I'm a great swimmer. So I make it back to where I can make out the shoreline, and I notice a guy isn't there. I can't even give you a time estimate of how long it took me to get back to shore, but I did make it back eventually. Exhausted. By this point, I decided to call my crabbing trip off and started walking home. As I start walking up the driveway of my house, I notice that the front door's ajar. I quickly rush inside and call for my mom. I hear her in the back room yell for me. So I make my way back there. My mom is sitting on the love seat in the family room, and the guy from the ocean is sitting right next to her. She tells me that she knows this is going to sound weird, but this guy's my father. She says that just after I was conceived, he went out to look for crabs and never came back. I am in complete shock and assuming this is all a joke. I start giggling to myself and the man gets up and says, You're grounded! I stopped giggling and look at him perplexed. He tells me he's just kidding. That he missed me. And that our family is not made for crabbing because we suck at it. And that I'm never allowed to go crabbing again. A week passes and we're finally setting into the normal family scene. 
It's pretty great because my entire life I've never had a dad and then just out of nowhere he swims out of the ocean and poof, I got a dad. So we're talking at the kitchen table and my mom had went off to work by this point. He tells me that yes, our family isn't the great at crabbing, but we should give it a go together and maybe we'd have a better shot. Once we get there, however, he tells me that it was nice knowing me and he jumps back in the ocean. He tells me I'm a failure and that I'm the reason he's leaving. And then he's gone. It's been three years now and we still have no idea where he went. I was going to file a missing persons report, but the police told me since he jumped in on his own, he's an adult, he can figure it out. So once again, I don't have a dad. That's a stupid ass story. I'll tell you what. I was gonna make him like a crab man, but then like I didn't know how to make him a crab man. Cause that sounded stupid. But I guess this whole story is stupid. Can't win them all. Can't win them all.